Hello, and welcome to Lean Into Green. I'm Jenny LaMorgan, and I'm excited to be here with my guest today, Kimberly Freeman Brown. And before I get to telling you what Kim's work is and why you want to listen to her, I want to start and share a little bit about our Lean Into Green Telesummit, in case you're listening in for the first time. I'm a green entrepreneur and owner of greenwomanstore.com, and we want to share more about how going green enriches our lives, our happiness, our wealth, and our health, certainly. And we want to share the wholeness of going green, personally and collectively, domestically, politically, spiritually. And we want to deepen our relationships with the earth and understand and experience going green at a deeper level. No matter where we're at, we can always step in a little deeper and these solutions and tips that we get from our from our um, experts help us to do that. So thank you very much, and I'm going to welcome Kim. Kim Freeman Brown is the Washington Office Chief at Green for All. She has roots in the environmental movement and the environmental justice movement. For the 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development, Kim served as editor of Cry of the Excluded, a compendium of essays from environmental leaders and human rights defenders from throughout the global south. Green for All focuses on clean air and water, energy efficiency, transportation, and food, because these are the issues that offer the tremendous opportunity to create jobs, revitalize communities, and protect public health. Green for All is dedicated to improving the lives of all Americans through a clean energy economy. The national organization works in collaboration with businesses, government, labor, and grassroots communities to create and implement programs that increase quality jobs and opportunities in green industry, all while holding the most vulnerable people at the center. Welcome, Kim, and thank you for your very good work and much-needed work. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. All right, you're a, you're a very important piece of our Lean Into Green. So can you tell us how you got involved in the environmental movement? Sure. I, um, uh, I've i been a social justice activist for over 25 years and um, had a number of friends who, um, uh, who worked on environmental justice issues in the early 90s. And I have to say I, I had no idea of... Um, how uh, the disproportionate uh, uh, location of toxic facilities near low income and communities of color were affecting the health and livelihoods of um, of folks who look like me and um, uh, I was so moved and so horrified um, ha- after meeting Native Americans on reservations whose kids were be, were being born with hearts outside of their bodies because of their um, proximity to pollution and African-American children with high rates of asthma in communities that were literally a stone's throw from petrochemical facilities in Louisiana. I was deeply affected by this and started working um, on uh, really combating environmental injustice um, directly. Uh, and it's always been an issue that I've cared about, um, having worked on a number of other issues since then. But Join Green for All last year um, was uh, really coming full circle for me. Um, and it gave me the opportunity to marry um, the passion and frustration and anger I felt about what was confronting uh, uh, low-income folks and people of color that I experienced 20 years ago um, marrying all of that passion with what Green for All focuses on, which is really um, uh, really leveraging the amazing talent and ingenuity of folks within these communities to actually do something about climate change and about um, how pollution was affecting their communities. And that's what Green for All does. It really is about making sure that uh, the people of color um, and low-income folks who are a part of the solution are not only part of the solution in the communities in which they live, but their efforts are actually being scaled up and replicated nationally. You you also do some business coaching and mentoring for green entrepreneurs in um, communities of color. And 
the most vulnerable communities. Um, can you tell us about the business coaching and how how that creates the leadership Absolutely. within the communities? Absolutely. Greenfall currently has a partnership with um, Accenture, um, the world-renowned management, management consulting firm, and the International Coaching Federation. And um, through our partnerships with both, um, we've created this selective program that aims to empower small business entrepreneurs, particularly those located in or serving vulnerable communities, um, so that they can, they can have the support that they need to grow their companies. And we love to work with folks who subscribe to a triple bottom line, um, which is not only, you know, turning a profit, which is important, but also um, uh, uh, starting and growing businesses that are good for the environment and put people to work, especially those who've been left farthest behind by the economic downturn. And why do you focus on a green economy versus other sectors? We focus on a green economy because um, we know that, um, you know, uh, the, the clean energy economy is one of the fastest growing sectors of our economy. And um, we wanted to make sure that as this burgeoning area of our economy begins to take root and to accelerate in its growth, we wanted to make sure that the, that the job opportunities, the economic development opportunities, and the economic growth that comes with that, um, uh, that people of color and those in low-income communities are part of that of that growth. We want to make sure that um, um, that those most affected um, and hit first and worst by things like climate change have an opportunity to benefit from um, from addressing it and make sure that those opportunities exist in their in their neighborhoods and cities and states as well. And I think that's smart, a uh, smart strategy because certainly green businesses are growing everywhere. And, and I know, too, just the statistics are showing that young people prefer to work in, in green jobs. Do you find that true with the communities that you're working with? Absolutely. I think young people, um, you know, have always been at the cutting edge of change um, in America. And I think the same could be said about their interest and investment in um, – in the green economy and really transitioning our um, uh, our our use of energy um, to a cleaner um, greener um, system systems like wind and solar and I think you know unlike uh, uh, me when I was a kid you know we wouldn't we didn't really talk about the environment as much um, uh, you know in school or outside of school now kids are so much more educated about the environment, and not only educated about it, but are really um, spearheading, um, you know, personal response, taking personal responsibility for protecting the environment within their families, within their schools, and within their neighborhoods. Um, and so, it's a beautiful thing to see. It's it's true. It's it's almost like they they uh, get educated and they bring it to us, and then and then it grows from there. Some a lot of it is beginning with the younger people. So can you tell us, you mentioned climate change. Can you tell us how climate change is affecting communities that are most vulnerable in the United States from coast yes. to coast? Yes. Well, you know, no one um, escapes the effects of climate change. We're all vulnerable to it. Um, but what we know to be true is that um, if you live in a low-income neighborhood or um, if you're a person of color, um, your community is likely hit first and worst. Um, for example, uh, in Los Angeles, African Americans are twice as likely to die in a heat wave. 68% um, uh, of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal plant, one of the primary producers of carbon pollution. Um, one in six African American children have asthma compared to one in ten nationwide. And, you know, we, we only have to look at um, the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina or um, or Superstorm Sandy to know that if you have come from a community that has the few that has fewer resources, you will likely have a harder time preparing for the natural disasters that we're seeing um, at an increased rate, um, surviving those disasters and recovering from them. And you mentioned uh, Native American communities. Um, you probably work both with urban. Native people and also with with reservations. Um, I'm I'm very aware of the birth defects from the uranium mining in particular 
on the reservations. That's Can you right. talk a little bit about both urban and and on reservation land because we get so little news of what's happening with native peoples. Right. No, I think that, you know, um and that's I think that's part of what Green for All really does is to look at the unique ways that communities are affected and made vulnerable by climate change. And, you know, so the solution to um, addressing or taking climate action will look different um, community to community. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, particularly in, in the Southwest, um, you know, where I've uh, visited um, the Diné people on reservations, um, mm -hmm. what we know to be true is water is a big issue. Um, and um, uh, so the way that um, those communities would want to address um, uh, climate change might be different from um, an inner city community in Chicago um, uh, would, who, you know, heat islands and the heat island effect might be the primary way that uh, climate change is affecting that community. Or in boroughs in New York City that, you know, are susceptible to uh, sea surges, um, that make them vulnerable to flooding, that might be the primary issue. So it's really, your work is very different around the around the country. Um, I Just one more point about the Native Americans. I know that some of the Native women now are in the forefront of the environmental movement and the treaty rights that have been so um, ignored and abused through the years are now benefiting all of us. They're using the treaty rights to protect our water and our air and our land. And, and so that's, that's a magnificent turnaround. Are you seeing women in particular having a, a strong role in, in the work that you do? Always. I, you know, as, as mothers, um, I think um, uh, women have a, a particular ability to be future focused. Um, and wanting to make sure that there's a legacy of hope um, and health um, that we're uh, working toward for our, our children and our future generations. And I think that that is inherent in the way that um, all women approach, um, you know, activism around issues like the environment. So I would absolutely um, say and have witnessed that Women can be some of the most creative, resourceful, tenacious, um, bold um, organizers and activists um, and entrepreneurs when it comes to um, uh, creatively finding ways to um, protect the environment. And that's, uh, it, it's our nurturing, you know, our nurturing and our motherhood and, um, and our sisterhood, I think, that's right. that is is growing now so that it's not just women that are embodying this nurturing way of, of taking care of the environment. It's really a very old part of our culture to to think forward and to have concern for the next generations. Absolutely. So I think that it's really um, – and, and those next generations are being very vocal. <laughs> the, the young people are really taking leadership nationally, globally, internationally – it's really beautiful to see. It, it gives me so much hope. I have no um, no worries about our future. I agree. So, can you give us some examples of folks who are succeeding at Green for All and, and tell us some success stories? Sure. Um, I have great examples of, um, of uh, business leaders, um, particularly women business leaders. For example, we work with... Um, uh, a woman, um, Donna Saunders, um, who is a woman of color who started her own energy efficiency business in Kansas City. Um, and um, she uh, is uh, helping to really save energy and fight, and fight climate change. And she's a leader with Energy First, which advocates for energy efficiency across the country. Um, and then, you know, we have another young woman that we work with uh, in Baltimore, close to where I live, um, also a young woman of color whose company um, does environmental remediation um, and helps keep families safe from lead and mold and other toxics found in homes. Um, she lost this business um, just last year and now hires graduates from a job training program that she herself went through. 
so she's bringing in in younger folks to to uh, to learn the to learn the tools of the trade. That's wonderful. Absolutely. And and environmental remediation is really, um, I think, so needed in in these vulnerable communities. Certainly, um, I've seen it here in California. I used to live in Oakland, and and um, the oil refineries were really a problem. And this was 20 years ago. So, Mm -hmm. you know, at that time we were just beginning to identify environmental racism as an issue. And then um, I think it's, I think that's very much a part of the work that you're doing now and, and with a very positive um, results and a, and a positive spin because you're focusing on the economy. That's right. And, and solutions. And what we know to be true is, um, uh, not only are communities of color and low income neighborhoods, um, you know, on the front lines of experiencing climate change, but they're also on the front lines of addressing it, um, through bringing innovative solutions as college students, as entrepreneurs, as, uh, as, uh, community leaders, as locally elected officials. Um, and so we want to make sure that their voices are brought to bear in the national discourse around how we're combating climate change. And how does Green for All get involved with any with any government policies, with legislation, with with the EPA? Where are you involved there? Mm-hmm. We work very closely. Um, uh, you know, we've talked a lot thus far about our work outside the Beltway, but we do work very closely with the Obama administration um, and um, uh, members of Congress, particularly the Congressional Black Caucus, who has one of the best voting records um, uh, on the Hill with respect to environmental issues, um, the, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and the Gr- Congressional Progressive Caucus, um, to make sure that the interests of their constituents, which are predominantly folks of color and um, uh, communities that are underserved, um, to make sure that their interests are um, are well represented as we craft and create plans um, to not only address climate change, but to really harness our investment in the green energy economy for the economic benefit uh, of, uh, of, their, of, of these communities. That's really important to be important to be a strong voice in that area. So thank you for for the outreach that you do as well. Now you provide um, you have a fellowship and academy program that cultivates local leaders from communities of color and low income communities across the nation to create leaders in an inclusive green economy strong enough to lift people out of poverty. Um, and this again, you're focusing a lot on climate solutions and clean energy. Can you tell us a little bit about that program? Sure. You, you, you mentioned you're meaning our our college ambassador program. Yes. Right. Our college ambassadors. It's an exciting program um, where we provide leadership training for college students, primarily those on historically black colleges and universities of con- across the country. Um, both to cultivate the next generation of green leaders, um, particularly from um, communities of color, and to provide them with the tools and support um, for themselves and their student organization as they step up into new um, levels of uh, leadership within the broader environmental movement. And allowing them and giving them the the, – the peer training and the mentor training to to become environmental innovators. Absolutely, absolutely. That sounds so exciting. (laughs) It is, and they're uh, doing really interesting things. For example, just last October, um, the former um, Jackson, Mississippi mayor, Harvey Johnson, honored um, one of our ambassadors, Alicia Crudup, um, with the Jackson's Best Award. Um, she was recognized for reviving the city of Jackson's summer environmental camp so that she could um, create curriculum and, um, uh, and activities that would help teach kids in her community about green issues like lead safety, water conservation, renewable energy, and pollution. Um, so not only are these folks doing uh, incredible work in their local communities, their efforts are being recognized 
um, by local officials. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And and I'm I'm just seeing how with the involvement of so many young people in Green for All, how that's just going to trickle all through their communities, through their families. Um, do, what do you hear about the older generation's um, acceptance of all of these new green ideas? Well, I think you're right. I think young people are um, are often uh, so catalytic um, in their families, in their schools, in their um, in their uh, uh, faith communities, um, when they get excited about something, they often encourage their parents, their grandparents, their aunts and uncles, their friends to also get on board with recycling or um, just paying attention to issues that maybe, um, you know, weren't on the radar screen of of adults around them. Um, So I think that um, young people are definitely leading the way and encouraging us to um, to take better care of the environment. And at Green for All, recognizing kind of like the power of young people, we're also trying to work with um, with uh, celebrities that appeal to young people, um, folks like um, from the hip-hop community like um, the rapper Drake and Wiz Khalifa and the Black Eyed Peas and others um, who can help raise um, uh, the issues um, that we're concerned about to a broad audience of young folks who can become even more aware and, um, you know, take their passion for doing something to make the world better um, uh, to the next level. That's wonderful because making it popular and making it making it um, the thing to do is wonderful. Yes. So it certainly helps the young people to get more involved. All right. Can you tell us more about the connection between communities of color and the environment and how that all plays out? Because it's not something that that we're very aware of and that we get much news coverage on, certainly. Right, yeah. You know, I think that uh, the connection between communities of color and the environment um, is one that I think um, – is really reflected in um, in protecting our own health. Um, in D.C., for example, where I live, there have been record high temperatures in the last few weeks. Across the country, we've seen tornadoes, floods, fires, storms, at increasing levels. And um, uh, what we know that that does, it just makes folks more vulnerable um, to the calamities that happen around the natural disasters that are being stimulated and aggravated by climate change. Um, and as we talked about earlier, if you're in a community that, um, you know, has limited resources, you're just less likely to be able to escape when you know that, when, you know, when you know that you're in harm's way or that a disaster is imminent, um, and you're, more li- you're, you're less likely to be able to recover um, uh, from those sorts of incidences. Um, And then, you know, communities of color um, uh, are just disproportionately located near um, very toxic, um, polluting facilities or along uh, along transportation routes where toxic um, uh, materials are and hazardous materials are are, uh, transported and that those are also those those factors are also having a devastating health effect um in these communities at alarmingly high rates that are often higher than the national average so a lot of the education that you do is has a preventive aspect to it as well especially in in the area of health Absolutely, absolutely, because I think it's important for folks to know who might not realize that high rates of asthma in our communities have everything to do with, um, you know, living near um, places where, um, you know, public transportation buses may be idling or, you know, might have something to do with the proximity of living near a petrochemical company or um, or a coal plant or, um, other polluting facilities, um, and so it's it's you know it's up to Green for All takes it as an, as an important part of our mission to make sure that we're helping folks connect the dots between um, you know uh, chronic conditions that we see at high rates in our communities 
and, um, uh, you know, what's happening with the environment. So health, of course, is a big issue um, in in all of our communities, but connecting the environmental reasons for some of our really chronic health problems is uh it's it's very important. What other health issues do you see in the in the communities that that are connected to the either climate change or pollution? And um, I know we talked a little bit about the birth defects on the Indian reservations. Is there anything else that stands out in your in your work? In well, I think heart health? heart disease, premature death, are all and uh, in addition to asthma are um all linked to um uh uh to exposure to pollution from coal plants for example mm-hmm. um and um uh as we talked about earlier we know that 68% of african americans for example live within 30 miles of a coal plant wow um uh That's so nice. those are some of the um you know some of the health concerns that are derived from, you know, environmental origins. So energy efficiency, certainly using less coal, is is a huge benefit to these communities. And um, can you talk about the efforts that uh, Green for All does in the area of energy efficiency? It's it's, it's a kind of a full circle back to the communities, the benefit. Absolutely, absolutely. We definitely advocate for um for, you know, community people to really um encourage their their civic leaders to invest more in energy efficiency um and other clean energy um solutions. One because um of the um environmental impact um that we know that they'll have, but also because we know that um you know, transitioning to a cleaner energy economy creates all sorts of um, opportunities um, for jobs um, and other economic um, development and community benefits um, that are communities that have been farthest left behind by the economic downturn so desperately need. So can you talk about some of the solutions within the community that that – that we can look to for for health reasons for um for energy efficiency you know what what are some of the solutions that that are coming coming in um to help and and to mitigate these situations sure no we've been working um with the communities um in Oregon for example um on creating higher standards for energy efficiency work and as a result, 500 people got jobs, um, one-third of them for, um, from disadvantaged communities. And um, we uh, work with um, a single mom named Sari who went from welfare to a career in energy efficiency. Um, so we know that, um, you know, uh, stories like Sari's represent kind of like the win-win opportunities that exist from not only addressing our environmental concerns, but um, leveraging them for economic benefits. That's wonderful, and and finding so much leadership when you're in in the process of educating communities and bringing that piece in. Can you talk a little bit about food issues? Sure, and, um, and ha- how that's certainly um, connected with health, but and water, I'm sure. Right. Yeah. Food. Um, you know. The, the first thing to, to, to acknowledge is that, you know, the floods and the droughts and um, fires that we've experienced um, and the high heat that we're experiencing at alarmingly increased rates because of climate change have an impact on food. Um, I don't think anyone uh, is unaware of rising food prices as a result of any and all of those, um, you know, natural um, disasters that we've seen in our communities across the country. And, you know, rising um, uh, food costs are tremendously um, impactful, in, um, uh, particularly for families that don't have, that have limited resources. So there's an inherent link between the environment and um, food security, um, particularly if you're, um, 
if you're uh, a family that has a hard time making ends meet. Um, so we have to think about, um, as we think about, you know, providing solutions to climate change, we have to also make sure that we make uh, food security an important thing that we're also um, championing. And does that uh, lead into farmers' markets and um, entrepreneurship that way and also um, just small farming, organic farming? Yes, absolutely. And it's been amazing to see how many um, communities across the country that we work with, be they urban communities or rural ones, who are starting community gardens um, and who have turned those into um, enterprises where they're actually um, uh, sourcing locally grown food um, um, to businesses, to schools, um, and also giving it away to uh, families and neighbors in need. Um, so it's one of the ways that we've seen um, the communities that we work closely with um, really, um, you know, utilize their ingenuity to find solutions um, uh, to food insecurity. And to really increase the nutrition that they're able to bring into the families. Right, right, because as we all know that there are neighborhoods that are virtual food deserts where access to good, healthy, fresh mm -hmm. produce is hard to come by. Um, and Green for All has also um, advocated, along with our uh, local activists, to make sure that um, uh, folks that rely on uh, food assistance programs can utilize those benefits um, at farmers' markets. That's an important change. I, we've seen that happen here in California, and it's it's very important to to open open access to to nutritious foods that way. Now, I know that the Trust for Public Land in San Francisco and I, and on the East Coast, maybe they're out there too. I know that they work a lot with community gardens. Do you work with other environmental organizations in your work? We do. We're, we're very connected. Um, to local, state, and national organizations um, in all aspects of our work, um, including our work with um, our ambassadors and fellows and uh, community partners that do uh, community gardening. Wonderful. So tell us some more stories, some more um, success stories of folks that you've worked with in, in different communities across the country. Certainly, we're excited about um, the work that um, uh, that we're doing uh, and that we're seeing spearheaded by um, public utility executives. So, for example, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission um, is planning a massive rebuild of its sewer system using green infrastructure, and they're being very deliberate about creating good jobs for underrepresented communities in this process. And they're not alone. We're seeing more and more public utilities across the nation that are also adopting that same sort of um, uh, those same sort of objectives and goals. Because what we know to be true is that per President um, Obama's climate action um, plan that he released, that infrastructure investment, um, uh, you know, really investing in clean infrastructure is one of the ways that we can not only improve um, the health of our environment, but also uh, a way that we can improve the health of our economy. Um, so we're working um, from, from local communities um, to the federal government to figure out successful ways to really do just that. It's, it, you really have a wide scope of, of issues that you work with and, and people that you work with. So we do we, have because we we really think that you know this issue um this issue is wide in scope and scale and um uh uh you know I think it could be overwhelming um uh to think you know what could one person or one organization do but um you know at Green for All, we know that it's going to take all of us to really um uh make sure that future generations have clean air and clean water and so um, we're committed to working um, uh, with people with a broad swath of society to make sure that, um, you know, we leave behind for future generations um, a clean and healthy environment. And it's, you know, so many 
um, there's a lot of pieces to going green. There's a lot of pieces to turning turning the tide, and in a community, and and it, certainly in our nation. And I really appreciate the the large scope that you all have taken on and the impact that you're making um, in all areas, legislatively, in health, in food, clean air, and water. So um, I know, are, are you a 501c3? We are. Okay. So we have some links for your organization that we're going to make available to folks. And we have a greenforall.org link. We have climate change and communities of color, a link for that program. We also have a link for your business engagement newsletter. Can you tell us a little bit about that? A link to the business engagement program? Uh-huh, the newsletter yes. for that program? Yes. Um, you know, that that's a, a great program. Um, that's it's, it's just a little broader than the business coaching that we talked about before. So often, um, you know, we've created this network of green entrepreneurs, um, particularly small business owners across the country, um, that subscribe to the triple bottom line, profit, people, and, you know, protecting the environment, Um uh, approach to um, to doing business, and we work very closely with this network um, to make sure that um, that um, their businesses are succeeding. Because what we know is that our com- our economy, the success of our economy, is really tied to the success of small business owners um, uh, who are great employers. And when um, we have, you know, when we see green entrepreneurs succeeding, we know that we're also succeeding in ensuring that um, uh, that our environment is, is healthy. That's wonderful. And you have another newsletter, Communities of Practice newsletter. Can you tell us about that? We're going to have a link up for folks to join on those newsletters. Sure. Um, what we attempt to do at Green for All is to make sure that professionals with on-the-ground experience in um, – in improving the environments in their local communities and, and um, cities and states are connected to national experts so that they can shape and advance really cutting-edge practices for growing an, an inclusive green economy. And so that's what our communities of practice are about. It's about sharing what worked, sharing what de- didn't work, sharing models of success so that um, we don't always have to reinvent the wheel, that something that you know may have gone successfully in Cincinnati can be replicated in Oakland or Chicago or Cleveland. Um, and so the communities of practice in the newsletter um, derived from, um, uh, from um, those networks um, become a conduit for sharing information. So you're really a resource not only for, for individuals, but you're a resource for organizations and politicians and Absolutely. And, uh, it's not just about lifting up what we're doing at Green for All, but what's working um, out in the field across the country. And do you find cooperation among the mayors of, of the cities? They Very seem much to be- so. Um, we found that um, folks like Mayor Kevin Johnson in Sacramento and Mayor Nutter in Philadelphia and others um, are um, really leading the way and looking at how they can make their cities greener and cleaner and leverage them for economic benefit, for particularly for um, for disadvantaged workers and families. Um, so, yes, we, we love working with our um, elected officials, both at the city level all the way up to members of Congress. Well, thank you for being our voice on the ground and, and in legislative quarters. Um, it's just a wonderful work that you do, and we have a link also for you to donate to Green for All. They do um, amazing work, as you've just heard. So we want to thank Kim Freeman Brown for being with us. We want to thank Green for All for all of their wonderful and important and um, very resourceful work. And uh, and thank you to all of you who are listening. Thank you, Kim, for for educating us on all the work that you do. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being with you. All right. We're going to stay in touch. I'm going to sign up for some of your newsletters and and just keep informed. I think that um, it starts with education for all of us, even even those of us who are already stepping into the to the green lifestyle. There's so many pieces that we can still learn about. So 
Going Green is a journey. It's a personal journey and a collective one. So we've joined with uh, with Green for All today, and you may want to invite your family and your friends to join us and listen to these calls. Our experts provide a wealth of information as well as tips and tools for going green. We hope you'll join us on every single call. Every morning we will send you an email with a link for the interview of the day. I hope you'll take the time to make leaning into green a priority in your life, and I hope that we've inspired you today to go green in many new and rewarding ways. Thank you, Kim Freeman-Brown with Green for All, and thank you all for joining us. Keep listening.